Hey folks, Joe Valley here, host of the Quiet Light Podcast. Thanks for joining us on another episode. Do not fast forward. Just like I said last week, I want to make an announcement. This is the second time that I'm going to do it, and then uh, I'm never doing it again. Um, we are seeking two more highly qualified advisors to join the Quiet Light team in Q1 of 2022. You have to have built, bought, or sold your own online business. Hopefully all three. Shoot me an email, uh, joe at quietlight.com. In the subject line, write, can I join the team? Give me your LinkedIn profile. Uh, make sure that you uh, tell me right there, then and there, that you've built, bought, or sold your own online business, and sometimes all three. Our guest today did just that. She uh, built a uh, Shopify store, an e-commerce business, uh, from nothing, sold it through Quiet Light, and then uh, talked to Jason about joining the team, took some well-deserved, well-earned time off and joined the team. Her name is Elaine Eason. Pat, you've had a chance to talk with Elaine and work with Elaine a few times. You want to say anything about her before you bring her out of the green room? Yeah, as I was saying when, when you and I talked before, I was just incredibly impressed with Elaine, and I don't mean to embarrass her right in front of her, but when we talked uh, originally when she was thinking about joining the team, it's just she asked all the right questions. She was humble in so many ways, but yet seemed to be a sponge, which I think anytime you come into something like this when it's new, especially a quiet light with as many facets as there are, it, it definitely takes that. I was just overly impressed with her, and obviously she's she's going to be incredible. Well, I think um, you and I talked about it on the last podcast we did together. Uh, Elaine, like so many others, makes us feel like we're not qualified to do what we do because she's got so much experience and at a young age, too. You and I are old guys compared to Elaine. No, we're we're like way old. According <laughs> to some of these, some of these kids are like our kids. Dinosaur. But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's that's what's beautiful about quiet. Like, I, I I can't. I probably learned more in the last year than I did in the previous five in anything. And it's not not a joke. There we have that many smart people, including Elaine. All right, let's bring Elaine out of this fictitious uh, green room. Elaine, take yourself on mute there. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate you Hello, hello. Out. So excited to be here, you guys. Thank you for having me. I'm just cracking up over here about the age thing. Because <laughs> it's true. You said it. You said it yourself. That's why it's funny. Truth is, uh, comedy is, is the closest thing to truth, right? If you're making stuff up, it's not funny. But when it's really close to the truth, it's very funny. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm super excited and thrilled to be part of an amazing team. Well, why don't you tell us about your uh, journey from, you know, uh, whether you had a job or not, I don't actually know, but your <laughs> entrepreneur, you know, college to your entrepreneur uh, journey. Yeah, yeah. So I started my first e-commerce business actually in high school. Um, I started an Etsy store selling handmade Mardi Gras masks. Um, I got some connections with wedding planners. And at the time, it was a really big trend to have masquerade events, weddings, et cetera and just started selling them in bulk. Uh, it was a great little business for me. Uh, wasn't huge, but you know, grew to five figures of revenue for me as a high school student. I was like 16 years old. So it's a pretty good gig for my after school time. Five figures at the age of 16? Holy cow. Yeah. It's yeah amazing. It was, what was your margin on that? What, were, what was your net bottom line margin? Uh, maybe about 15%. That's amazing. No, no lady, I am. Guess. I am super curious on that because while most kids are either going to volleyball practice or hanging out with a band or hanging with friends, you started a business. What made you do that? I know it sounds like, you know, cliche, but I've always been that entrepreneurial type, like making art, trying to sell it to my uncles and, you know, trying to make a buck, had a lemonade stand, all that, you know, stereotypical things as a kid, um, just really been interested in just the process of making money. And this was kind of my first foray into entrepreneurship, like on a bigger scale was starting this Etsy store, but it, it really opened my eyes to the opportunities that are available by being a business owner. Um, so I went on to, in um, college, I studied entrepreneurship as my focus. And um, after that, I worked for a few years in corporate before starting um, the more recent business that I sold through Quiet Light. What's that like studying entrepreneurship in college? Because it didn't exist when Pat and I went to college. What do you study? What are you learning? Yeah, I mean, it's I'd say it's kind of like a general business management degree, but um, we had like a class on new product development. I talked about where to how to source products, how to design products. Um, we had like a small business marketing and 
would I go back and do that degree again? I, I don't know. I probably would have done better with something like finance or accounting to get those really, those hard mm-hmm. skills down. Mm-hmm. But, but it has served me. I do go back and use some of that stuff in some way, shape or form even today. How long before uh, you started that first business from out of college to starting your business? And did, so, you, did, and did you ever have a job? Do you ever go work? Yeah, I've had, a, I've had a lot of jobs. Okay, so you had yeah. jobs. Yeah, you actually yeah. had jobs. You haven't been from college to self-employment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, when I left for college, I actually sold that business to a family friend. So I guess that was my first exit, if you will. It wasn't for much. It's a few hundred dollars just to transfer ownership over to her and show her how, how to run the ropes. Awesome. Um, but yeah, in college, I studied. After that, I worked as a data analyst for about three or four years at a couple of different fortune 500 companies. So living the life of spreadsheets all day. Wow. That sounds terrible. How long <laughs> yeah. was the APA for your $200 business? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question, Pat. I don't Asset even know if we had agreement. a formal contract to be hundred percent honest with you. I don't, I don't think we did. It was just kind of like, here you go. You know, Elaine, I do have a question. What was your most fun business? The most fun business. What did you enjoy the most? I mean, was it your first one? Was it the last one? Was it in between? I, I'd say in between. I've also dabbled a little bit in real estate. So I, I have a short-term rental property. I'm hoping to expand into more of those. But that was the most fun for me. I, I still like that because it's pretty passive. Whereas um, I love the e-commerce. I love the building part of creating a business. Like having an idea and bringing it into fruition is so, so rewarding. But I also love the idea of like, okay, now that like the short-term rental, I just kind of set it and forget it. And that is really nice. Whereas e-commerce, you build this and then you have a ship to manage. You have to keep keep building it. You know, everything that goes into that is it's a full-time job if you're running a decent size e-commerce store. So there's do you pros have someone, and cons. Do you have someone else uh, managing the short-term rental or are you doing that yourself? Uh, we have a property management company that you does do. that. Yeah. Is, is that the one in Florida or Colorado or somewhere else? It is in Florida. Now for your net, I'm just curious. I'm going to go on a tangent here. Pat, bring, re, reel me back in when it happens. Oh, you're good. Um, for your next short-term rental property, are you thinking another location that you'd like to spend some time in? Or are you thinking where you can actually rent it a lot and make a lot of money or both? Um, probably rent to make a lot of money. Okay. It, it's kind of a funny situation how that all came to be, but we purchased this property in the Orlando area um, and would, we wanted to travel the world, me and my boyfriend. So we wanted to be digital nomads, if you will, and travel and work remotely, um, see the world. And so we we purchased a property that we knew was zoned properly so that we'd be able to rent it while we're gone. And it ended up being that the return was so great, we never wanted to go stay there. It's like, let's just rent it out and you know keep exploring other places. So that's how that came to be. Um, but for future ones, I would probably look for return primarily as opposed to some place I'd want to stay because, you know, it's more fun to just always explore new places on vacation and just, you know, get income from what I've set up. And it's still uh, worth doing in this real estate market? I think still- so. In certain locations, I, I mean, it's probably, it's definitely getting more challenging, but there are still opportunities. Uh, I have a couple of places in Colorado I've been looking at and maybe a place in New Mexico. So. There's opportunities out there. Very cool. Very cool. Well, tell us about the um, the e-commerce business that you built that you ended up selling uh, through Quiet Light. Yeah. So I started this business while I was working that nine to five data analyst job. Not that I hated that job, but I, I wanted something more for myself. Like I always knew I wanted to own, own my own business and make money on my own time and schedule. Um, so that was really my motivation for starting it. But I found something that I really loved and I saw an opportunity in it. So that was aerial yoga. Okay. If, you haven't heard, if you haven't heard of aerial yoga, it's kind of a blend of yoga and aerial acrobatics. And it's absolutely amazing for people that have back pain, of course, for flexibility. You get the, ver- the benefits of inversion therapy along with the benefits of yoga. If Pat and I were doing it, would it be necessary to wear a helmet? Because we'd probably uh, fall and get a concussion. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll be there to spot you guys. If you, if you want to give it a try, just call me up. I'm open anytime. You know, Elaine, I find that fascinating. You know, many years ago, I did uh, Beachbody. The, and part of that is yoga. And that was my weakest thing because I just, at 6'4", I couldn't get in those positions. How how were you able to attract people and how were you able to educate people on, because you just mentioned it. You just said, well, we could do it. And I would have thought, no way. So how did you educate people in your company to understand how to do that? 
Yeah, it's a good question. And it's a combination of different things. Um, we made video tutorials to start. To start, it was just me making tutorials. Over the years, I hired instructors that would help us make that content, blog articles. Um, it was kind of a hybrid of working with individuals like you guys, if you were like, I'm going to try early yoga, and you wanted to purchase equipment online, as well as working with instructors and business owners. So that was another big tenant of our business was gyms or studios that wanted to add a cool niche fitness offering to what they already were doing. Were you importing the uh, products from overseas? Yeah, we were. And how did you, let's talk about when you first decided to do this. Did you make a big investment in product? Did you buy some from a reseller? How did it go initially to get the business started? Yeah, to, initially I had followed some information about drop shipping online. So I ordered a bunch of products to try and test the quality of. Um, and I worked with one of those suppliers to kind of customize it a little bit. I found someone really awesome that wanted to work with me, even though I had like no sales or background. Somebody is, I guess, driven like me, just trying to make something happen. And he, he made some customizations to the kit that I requested, like the types of uh, hardware that came with it, adding my own branded instructions, um, my own inserts into the packaging, et cetera. So once I worked with him, we continued to work together for like five years. It was a great relationship um, and, and just grew together over that time frame. What, what year was this that you just started this business? Um, 2015. 2015. See, it's getting to be a blur. Imagine what, what's going to happen when you get to be Pat's age. It's going to be awful. You can't remember anything. Oh, no. <laughs> You're not that old, Pat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am. I think I'm older. Uh, there's no question about that. I think I'm older than Pat. So, I'm just Lane, what was, I mean, obviously a lot of people take passions and they turn them into a business, which clearly is something you did. What, I mean, when you woke up, I mean, I think about it and if someone had told me and I'm versed in e-commerce that, hey, we'll do a yoga website, I'd be, you know, maybe obviously supplies, but it would have been foreign to me at first, kind of like the magnet fishing business I had to research that I sold. So tell me what led you to that. Were you in that or did you see that that was a need or, or how did you come up with it? Yeah, I mean, it was something that I tried myself, not thinking about it as a business idea, but initially was interested in it just as like a creative outlet, something to de-stress, something to help with back pain. Um, I just tried it and I liked it and I researched more of it. And it seemed to be something that was on the up and up, but relatively obscure at the time. Like, I mean, it's, it's blown up over the last five years, but even five years ago, you asked an average person, they probably don't know what you're talking about. Whereas today it's pretty well known, but I went to a class. I loved it. The teacher that I had there was absolutely amazing. And from there, I just got that idea in my head that, you know, there could be an opportunity to help people do this at home because you don't have studios everywhere. And this is so much fun. It has great health benefits. And like, how do we make this more accessible? So that's how I got the idea and set me on a path of researching and came up with the business. And did you borrow money to get it started or did you bootstrap it from savings? Totally bootstrapped, totally bootstrapped because drop shipping, you know, it's very low barriers to entry. You don't need much money up front. Like, I mean, under a thousand dollars. In, to get in started. First, yeah, but exactly. How long from the initial sales to when you started branding the product uh, for your product? Because it went from drop shipping to, you know, mm -hmm. straight up branded e-commerce store, right? Pretty, pretty quickly, like within the first few months, okay. because it, it evolved over time. In the first few months, it was like, I want this customized like this. And then I want these inserts in there. And then eventually it's okay. We are developing our own packaging and Eventually, we got to the point where we were importing. We we're no longer really doing drop shipping for the most part. Um, so it, it just evolved over time as the business grew. And at what point, uh, well, actually, a couple of questions first. Uh, how much ballpark, that first full calendar year that you were in business, any recollection, if you will, about how much revenue you did? Yeah, uh, $13,000. $13,000. <laughs> you did better in I high school. I almost quit. Uh, yeah, I know. I almost quit. I was like, this is... I, I remember like several moments, like distinctly in my mind where I was just having issues with one thing or another. And I was like, this isn't worth it. This is never going to work. And I almost quit so many times, but I didn't. What was the tipping point that made you go from 13,000 to, okay, wow, this is actually, you know, starting to get some traction. It was really that first holiday season. So out of that 13,000, at least 10 of that was in December. So that first holiday season hit and I realized this is super giftable. And January is also super strong. It's a fitness product. 
And that really just set the ground running for me and was like, okay, there's, there's something here and there's room to grow. Elaine, um, going back to what you said about, about growing it, I think that you mentioned something a lot of people that are listening, they can't get past that one thing you said. They, they had average results by their own you know, uh, numbers that they hoped for, but yet you kept pushing. Some people just stop there and they think, I don't want to invest or I don't understand how to tell, tell them how you got through that and what the pivot was that, that changed it for it. Because sometimes those are the turning points in business that make you successful or make you close. Yeah, I I think it's really something to do with the people around me at the time. So I had my boyfriend has supported me from the very beginning in my business endeavors. Like he's known that I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur and wanted to do that. And whenever I was having those those times where I was like, I don't know if this is worth it. Like he reminded me, he's like, look, this is why you started it. Like we researched, like look at this potential that we've seen. It's like you know, I know that it's like, it's going to be hard sometimes, but it's okay, you know, to take a day off, take a week off, just get back to it. Yeah. I think that's critically important. You just take that time off, separate yourself from the daily grind. And, and I, I do it by mowing the lawn. I like manual labor. I go out and do work in the yard and it's where I actually get some of my best ideas. All right. So 13,000 in the first full calendar year, and then you sold the business in 2021. What kind of revenue did did you do in, in the trailing 12 months prior to selling the business? Yeah. Um, over two and a half million. Ooh, wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. Well, <laughs> Pat's going, holy cow. That's, that's amazing. I mean, uh, people out there listening to this, imagine starting out with 11,000 and then moving it to 2 million and selling it for seven figures. That's, that's a amazing. very incredible accomplishment. What kind of, what, what kind of team did you have? When you did it, yeah, we had about eleven people when we finally sold. I had a team of writers on the team. Something that was really important to me was to be really value driven in our approach to business and making sure that we're providing value to the customers first. So, creating really high quality blog content, video tutorials was really at the forefront of that. So we had a team of bloggers, writers, um, instructors with that content, as well as customer service, uh, graphic designer. Maybe someone else I can't remember for odds and ends, but SEO, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And did they Elaine, all transfer? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Pat. Elaine, a lot of times people, you know, are good at one thing and not good at others. The interesting thing about e-com is you have to be good at a lot of things. You have to outsource. You have to find that. Was there something that happened or that you either outsourced or you just said, I'm going to research it and get better at it that became the thing that drove it? Is there one thing or is it multiple? Hmm. <sighs> That's a good question. I think that for our business, it was multiple things. Um, starting out, like I had no skills in e-commerce. I didn't, I didn't come from a, like a background of doing that besides, I guess, the Etsy store, but really like I didn't know how to run ads. And I, I taught myself that. Um, that was really pivotal in getting us off the ground because we were one of the first um, companies in that niche to be running Google ads, for instance. Um, and that was a big thing. Um, as far as outsourcing things, we got a really great email marketing team in that last year, and that really helped push things forward and took a lot of work off my plate. Um, it's really hard to outsource things. Like, you know, it's so easy to say like, oh yeah, you know, just, just find an expert and hire them. But finding people that really know what they're doing and, and can do it really well for your brand is, was something that I found really challenging. Um, but at the, at the very end, I felt really good about where we were in terms of our team and having good resources to hand off to the new owners. At, at what point did you start to think about the new owners and, and actually selling your business? Or was it always in your mind that you were going to exit someday? It was not in my mind that I was always going to exit someday. When I mean, when I built this, I didn't know that that was even an, an opportunity until maybe around 2019. Um, I went to a uh, digital nomad conference in Thailand and one of Quiet Light's competitors had a booth there. And that's how I first learned that this was even a thing, that there's marketplaces out there to sell online businesses. I was blown away. Um, ultimately, I ended up selling with Quiet Light. I found you guys in um, the e-commerce fuel forums. And we had such great reviews there that I was like, okay, let me, let me talk to these guys too. And I met with um, David Newell on our team maybe, maybe about eight months before I actually listed the business. And he was absolutely amazing. He was so detailed in his valuation um, with the business, asking all the questions. And I just felt like he really cared and wanted to have a full picture of my business. Whereas some other brokerages I talked to, it was just kind of like, give me the numbers, 
very high level, um, here's your valuation. But I felt like because David took that time to really understand it, that I had a more accurate valuation from him. And he's British. He sounds so damn charming too, doesn't he? <laughs> he, he really is. <laughs> <laughs> David's a former investment banker and, and he was actually head of brokerage services at FE International for a while. And once the non-compete uh, period was over, he came knocking. And we, Dave, uh, Mark and I always love David. He's just, he's one of those guys, again, that, that is just brilliant and, and humble at the same time. So he doesn't make us feel too much like idiots, but he's just, he's just brilliant. And I think, Elaine, if I'm not mistaken, he's also very much into meditation and yoga, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he is. So it was, it was wonderful to get to know him, even just from those couple of calls that we had together. Now, why is it that I thought that Jason was the listing broker for you? He was, he was. So I, I started with David Newell. That was my intro to Quiet Light and he sold me. I was like, I definitely I had all the best of respect for Quiet Light after that conversation, followed these podcasts over the following six months. David gave me really tangible items from those initial calls of things that I needed to do to maximize the value of the business. And I went to work. So I spent six months buckled down, long hours, getting everything moved over. Like we had some things that were self-fulfilled. We moved everything over to a 3PL, um, hired some people to outsource some of my tasks. And then ultimately we got to that point where I was ready to go to market. I called David up and he was like, oh, I'm actually busy right now, but I can connect you with one of my colleagues. I was like, oh no, I, I really wanted to work with you, David. But ultimately I got to work with Jason, who was also fantastic. And I have no regrets because he is a doer. Like he gets things done, he executes, and he is really a straight shooter and just got things moving super quickly. And it was an amazing experience. Yeah, Pat and I were just talking that about that last week on the podcast about uh, Jason and how efficient he is with his time. And I mean, man's getting, he was I think I've told you he was my advisor back in 2010. You know, nobody knows more about this this business than Jason does. So you were in two great hands there. Yeah. Um, uh, the transaction closed March, April, May. When, when did you end up? Yeah, um, around end of April. End of April. And what was the process like once you decided to sign an engagement letter, uh, work with Jason? How long did it take from the time you listed the business for sale to the time that you got your first offer? Yeah, so we listed it maybe, gosh, it's, it's been a blur, like sometime in maybe end of February, early March. Um, and it was really, really busy at that time. There was a lot of people trying to sell their businesses. And I remember one of the challenges we had was just finding a time on our email slot to be able to launch the business to the Quiet Light email list. So what we did is we did kind of like a soft launch where we launched the business on the website, but didn't do the full marketing push yet and tried to get some initial interest and gauge on the market. And we heard crickets. There was not a single inquiry, really, no questions. Nobody was interested in the business. And I started, started getting nervous. I was like, is, is this sellable? Is anybody going to want this? Like, I was ready to be done. Like, I, I was really, you know, had been working hard on that for five years and looking forward to moving on and spending more time with my family and just having more balance in my life. And I was... I was really getting stressed when, when there was nobody interested in the business in those first, in that first week or so. But then we went ahead and did that marketing push to the quiet light list and we got a ton of inquiries. So we had a lot of people asking for information um, and we had a handful of calls um, ended up being maybe around four buyers that were seriously interested. Um, and then to narrow down to like maybe two, we're going to put in offers. And then finally one put in a good offer and I, was, I jumped on it. I was like, let's do this. And luckily, it all worked out really well from there. You know, Elaine, it's it's really amazing because it's kind of like the old hair club for men commercials, which you won't remember. You're not only an owner, <laughs> you're a customer. So uh, looking at that, it's really an interesting perspective because less than a year ago, you probably had no idea how this was going to go. And now you're actually executing those. It's an amazing transition. So tell me what you learned from that, that you might apply to people as you're going out and doing the same thing for them. Yeah, I mean, I I understand why Quiet Light has this qualification. I know, um, Joe, you just put out that notice that we're trying to recruit more advisors here. And I understand really, really well why we have the requirement that you've been through this firsthand, because it is a very emotional and stressful process. 
It's like these sellers, they've spent so much time building these businesses. Like, and a lot of times this is their full-time job. They put in so much effort and it's such a big part of their life that it's, it's a very emotional process to let go of that. Um, and yeah, having experienced that firsthand, like I, even me being super ready to let go, like I didn't have qualms about moving on. It was just the whole process from start to finish feeling like, okay, maybe, maybe we're going to find buyers and then, you know, kind of being let down a little bit from that experience. I try and really be there for my sellers and be really communicative with them and try and set expectations and tell them how things are going. Because I know when I was in that, in those shoes, I was like, oh, is Jason calling me? Does he have an update for me constantly? So I, I try and stay on top of that. Yeah. And that's hard. You're talking about, um, Really, I think somebody that came to the table that was uh, an online entrepreneur in the uh, psychotherapy field would be incredibly high qualified to be an advisor at Quiet Light uh, because yes. it's a big part of what we do. I, I, I know that when I sold mine in 2010, you know, um, just weeks before, uh, you know, I thought we were going to close, the whole deal fell apart. And, you know, you just <sighs> kind of go crazy. And I, I think if you're doing it on your own, um, you know, you can drop your price, have terrible deals, whatever it might be. And, and Jason said to me, you know, after I joined the team, the difference between a good advisor and a great advisor is that the great advisor always gets it back on the rails um, when the deal falls apart. And, and most of them have some, you know, big tilting mm-hmm. of the train, if you will, on the, ra- on the trails, on the rails uh, to closing. Uh, so that's, it's a big part of what we do, which is, it's not just um, looking at numbers and doing valuations, but it's engaging, understanding goals and objectives, some, sometimes personal situations, um, but also managing people's emotions and expectations all along the way. And the better equipped you are to do that, the more successful you're going to be for your clients and the more people you'll be able to help. And you've been in it six months now, right? And uh, you started in August, I think? Yeah, September is a little less than that. September. But yeah. That's right. You were going to kick back for the summer and, and take the summer off, which is smart. Most people, when they sell a business, they, they jump right into the next one and don't <laughs> take any time off. So you're wise beyond your, your years. So really, we're only talking about four months here because um, we're recording in mid-December. What's it been like uh, so far in terms of the learning curve? And um, have you had your first listing yet? Talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had... Um... I've had a few listings already. Um, So as far as the learning curve, it's the best thing is that there's a great community of advisors here at Quiet Light that are more than willing to help. So everyone has been super helpful. If I have questions, trying to run, get a second opinion on evaluation, um, just how to handle different situations. The support here is unparalleled, I think. Um, What's been challenging is really like, just trying to get my flow going and, and uh, keep things keep things moving along. Um, I've had, especially in the beginning, just kind of like get, getting clients on board, getting people ready ready to list. Uh, is it can be time consuming. It's a lot of work to make sure that you're getting all of the details about a business correct. You're getting all the information correct, portraying it in an accurate way. Um, so I, I think going through the process has been the best learning experiences as of yet. Um, my first deal um, went under offer last, or actually went under offer a couple of weeks ago, and they signed the APA last week. They're in the middle of the asset transfer today. I think all of that is may get buttoned up this afternoon. I'm waiting on the green light from them, but that's very exciting. Congratulations for you and the client and the buyer. That's very quick. That's yeah. very quick in terms of from um, you know under under LOI a couple of weeks ago to an asset mm-hmm. purchase agreement to closing now. Why so fast? Is it what's is it a relatively small deal or a simple transaction? It's a it's a pretty simple transaction and two very experienced parties. The buyer and seller have both bought and sold businesses before, and they are wanting to get it done before the holidays. Mm. And if I recall, it's mid six figures, so it's not necessarily a small deal, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pat, she's way ahead of the curve. It took you for Oh, it's amazing. You know, I, actually, Elaine, I'm curious because, you know, I, I predate you maybe nine months, eight months. But, you know, as we started 
to get into it, obviously there's ebbs and flows and you learn so much and there's so much information coming at you. But the thing that I, I talked to Joe about that I love so much is the interaction and being able to learn from the entre- other entrepreneurs. Maybe tell us a little bit about your relationship so far with the people that you've worked with and, and how that side may be, you know, for me, it's probably the biggest side. I'm, I'm a big relationship guy. So I'm very close to everyone I've worked with still. So tell us about that and, and how you work with your entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a lot of valuation calls. I think that's the best thing you can do is to get on the phone with as many entrepreneurs as possible, just getting started because you get to learn all of the different business models, what people are doing, the nuances of different businesses. Um, And that's been a really fun part for me is getting to know them and getting to know people's backgrounds. Everyone has their own story and people are doing things in different ways. Like, um, yeah, it's incredible just to be able to learn from these few conversations that I've had. Um, But yeah, I've had a few connections that have have been really great in terms of um, getting to know each other. And in some instances, I've been able to provide a lot of value to them. And that always feels really good. Um, You know, it's great when you have some experience that can help somebody. Um, But yeah, I've had my first few clients uh, go to market and we've had some strong responses like that first one I mentioned. Um, But I'm still very green to this. I'm still learning a lot. Like I'm, I'm new, I'm learning, but Every transaction, every person that I get to meet, there's something that I can take away from those conversations. And you've got the full support of the team behind you when you have questions. You're never alone, are you? No, that's that's another important point. Is like I like I like I feel very very supported. I work with um, somebody very closely right now as a mentor here on the team. Um, so Is that, that Jason makes or it Chuck? Very, um, that's Chuck. Chuck. Okay. And then the small teams meetings that you have once a week, and of course the the. Uh, string email chain that we have it's not slack folks we need to go on a slack channel we're, we're not yeah. <laughs> we, we're, it's we're dinosaurs in some ways but we've got that one channel of communications that we're constantly uh, bantering back and forth on and sharing deal points and getting advice from and now it's really not like you're just working with lane you're working with lane pat joe mark jason amanda um and you know a, a lot of other folks as well so nobody's ever alone even though Pat, when you've got a deal, you're the point. You take it from beginning to end. It's what I did for a decade, right? You are that point person uh, and you don't let go. You know, uh, as you're learning on this deal you just did, Elaine, you're, you're deep into it from the very beginning all the way through to closing. So in buyer seller conference calls and due diligence, we don't hand it off to anyone. Mm-hmm. And that can be um, wonderful. It's the best thing to do because we, we have no junior brokers or advisors, as, as we say, and, and there's different folks at different firms that do different things. And in this case, you've got that one advisor with an incredible amount of experience all the way from the beginning to the end. I, th- I think that's an amazing part of what Quilight is because we send out emails to all the brokers and some people have no idea how really experienced some of our team is. I mean, obviously, Joe, I'm not I mean, Joe's a best-selling author, obviously, shameless plug. We have another gentleman who's wrote a book on this am. on this thing, but no one seems He's to so, have Hold on, ego. wait a second. I have to say it. Anytime you bring up my book and Walker's book, I have to say I'm no Walker Diable. He sold a lot more books than I have. I like that. <laughs> holding, holding that up, Pat. That's good. You're welcome, Walker. 40,000 books. Go, Walker. Shameless <laughs> plug. But anyway, the whole point is, is that no one has an ego emailing and asking questions. So if an entrepreneur comes in and there's something Elaine's struggling with, she's going to ask the Walker in the group or Walker may respond or, or John or me or Joe. I think it's amazing how people check their egos at the door. Even though we have super smart people, they don't expect they know everything. And that's such a big tool. And I think people are be shocked how much that really helps in any kind of those processes. All right. We've got a few minutes left. So Elaine, I'm going to put you on the spot with uh, what are your predictions for 2022? We've got inflation looming. It's here. We've got supply chain issues, you know, uh, people talking about the next market crash and things of that nature. If there's a downturn in the economy, what do you think is going to happen in this M&A world that we live in? Uh, Good question, Joe. And I mean, it's definitely going to be affected. I'd say it's concerns to have, but also if you're an entrepreneur listening to this, it's like you have to work on your own timelines. I'd really say I wouldn't put any bets on the future. Look at where you're at in terms of if you're looking to build your business to exit in the future and just work on your timelines with your business and what meets is going to help you get to your goals. Very well. I, mean, I do have one other question. You you're a first year advisor, which they have to buy expensive Christmas gifts for every other advisor. Are you finished? Oh, <laughs> 
Um, I think Chuck oh. took care of that for me, actually. <laughs> Getting a lump of coal, Pat. There you go. I went away on vacation and I came back to, this is the team that we have, people. Um, I was away on vacation. I launched the book June 15th and I had a, a vacation book the first week of July. And if you go to Amazon and you search for the Expreneur's Playbook, at least back in July, um, what what was the product? It was a laxative. No, it was an anti. No, it was a uh, docolax, wasn't it? Something Dude, like that. Something, something to make sure that you 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 if you had diarrhea, it prevented it. And it was a paid sponsor to add uh, right above my book. So the word exit <laughs> somehow in my book ended up you know, with Ducalax or whatever it was. Um, and I come back from vacation. My poor mother-in-law was house sitting, taking care of the dogs. And she's like, what is going on with you, Joe? There's like 17 boxes of, you know, anti-laxatives on the front porch. I'm like, oh God, thank you. And I that's Chuck. Like, oh. And, I, and, 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 and it was Chuck's idea, as, as uh, people have told me. So I've told Chuck, I, I, first of all, <laughs> Elaine, we can't trust him for Christmas gifts, but um, payback's a bitch. He's going to get it. And it, it could be two years from now. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about it and it's going to happen, but I just don't know what it is. Anyway, see, that's me going on a tangent, <laughs> tangent right then and there. Elaine, we're so excited that you're on the team. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible, the story and the success that you've had. Um, I look forward to what it's going to be like, as I said to Pat on the, on the last podcast I did with him, uh, you know, what it's going to be like in 10 years for you here at Quiet Light, because I certainly want you around that long. I think you'll be here longer than me, right? <laughs> A couple of decades, maybe. We'll see. I don't know. But I'm excited to uh, see what happens in 2022 and all the people that you can help. So welcome to the Quiet Light team. Thank you, Joe. I'm humbled to be here. We're humbled to have you on the team. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, folks. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week on the Quiet Light Podcast.